Everything right now in terms of communication is win-lose. And so here's a question I have for you. Is silence really silent? Think about it in your life. Is being silent ever really fix the problem? I would submit to you that it doesn't fix the problem. That silence can eventually, in some cases, lead to violence, can lead to pain. My passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs, that, that's on their way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. Greatnesswithin.com. Oh. Jay Hoisington. Greatnesswithin.com. Oh, if you dreaming it, believing it, work hard for it. And in the process, serve others in a positive way. Think, think you can do it. Hey there, I have a quick thought for you on the subject of communication. You know, I was recently listening to the Tucker Carlson and the Vladimir Putin interview and I found it to be fascinating. Not because I agree with everything or not, but simply because of what seemed to be an open dialogue of sharing some insights and some ideas with Americans that we often don't have access to. And I think this is a systemic problem, whether you're a leader in an organization, you're a manager, whether it's team members not feeling they can go to their leaders and have discussions and so forth. Listen, there is a challenge with communication. It just so happens that today I'm in my hotel room because I'm in El Paso, Texas, working with a large organization down here with our Leadership Academy. And in this particular session of the Leadership Academy, which is a seven month process, we're talking about communication. So all day long, we were talking about all things that had to do with communication, resolving concerns, crucial conversations, active listening, and so forth. But I couldn't help as I was teaching this course today and at the same time seeing what's in the news in Europe with all the tractors and trailers that are blocking the freeways and so forth out of frustration that the country leaders are limiting the fertilizer in the spirit of global warming or environmentalist issues and, and now you're having an issue where the people are pushing back. Why? Because there isn't a compromised conversation that would be more of a win-win scenario. There is no. It's all. Everything right now in terms of communication is win-lose. And so here's a question I have for you. Is silence really silent? Think about it in your life. Is being silent ever really fix the problem? I would submit to you that it doesn't fix the problem, that silence can eventually, in some cases, lead to violence, can lead to pain. We have to be able to communicate with each other without the receiver taking things personally and vice versa, with hearing other people's side of the story, their perspectives and so forth. So I thought I would share with you a post that I was going to post on X related to the Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin interview. And I thought I would just share it with you. And I think this same issue is common within organizations all day long. So this is what I was going to post. And you may agree with it. You may not. That's okay. Just follow me in terms of the spirit of what I'm trying to share with you. This is what I said. And I didn't post it, but I'm sharing it with you now. I thoughtfully and intently listened to the entire interview. Anyone with an open mind and desire for transparency and a spirit of seeking understanding would find this interview to be thought, a thought-worthy conversation. I learned a lot of history, frankly, in the first 30 minutes of the interview. It was all history, and I kept thinking, where's this going? Where's this going? And as you got into it, you started to see where it was going. And a lot of what uh, Vladimir Putin shared can be verified online, even through left-leaning and right-leaning news um, sites and so forth. So it wasn't all lies. I learned a lot from this. I learned a lot from the history and frankly, of what I heard made logical sense. I couldn't help but re reflect over Oliver Stone's documentary. Watch that documentary and listen to Putin's words and you'll find 
some consistencies. Who is, as Vladimir Putin was saying in the interview several times, he said, I got to ask you, who is the real boogeyman? Right? Why? Because we haven't had access to hear from Putin for years. Right? For whatever reason, the government doesn't think it's in our best interest to hear what these other leaders have to say. We've demonized them to the point that if you listen to them and want open and fluid conversation, then if that person doesn't share your ideology, then we have to do everything to shut them down. And that is my issue. There are people in this world that are powerful leaders that have thoughts. And you know what we should be doing is open up that bridge of communication. We should be seeking to hear their perspective. It doesn't mean we have to agree with it, but we should be listening to it. And this is exactly what happens inside organizations. Leaders aren't communicating with their team members. Team members don't feel that they have permission or feel comfortable going to their leaders because the leaders don't make that conversation piece and seeing eye to eye on things really, they don't encourage, leaders oftentimes don't encourage it. That's one thing we teach in our leadership academy is that you have to take an active role in creating an atmosphere where difference of ideas should be shared. It doesn't mean they're all going to be agreed upon, but let's have that open communication. Let's do our one-on-ones. Hey, let's not let the lag time between an issue arising and actually communicating about it to resolve the concerns go too long. Here's what I find. Oftentimes people, uh, you know, turn the cheek and let things slide, which on one hand is a good thing. But on the other hand, you just stay silent and you let things go, go, go until you get to the end of your rope. And then some people just blow up and then you went, wow, well, this was all built up. Listen, it's better to communicate in a forthright way with high diplomacy or tactfulness and be more direct with people with the warmth and empathy, the tactfulness, the diplom- you know, diplomacy and so forth so that people can receive what you're saying. Just being someone who's strong and communicating, but at the same time, not respecting how that message might be received is something to consider when you're communicating with someone. So, you know, when I think about these farmers that are in Europe, that you see all the tractors lining up, and why are they lining up? Because there are probably a small group of powerful people in in Europe and in many of those countries that want to eliminate fertilizer due to global warming or environmental factors and so forth. But here's the reality. It can't be a zero-sum game in life with people that have different perspectives and beliefs and ideas and stories and conditioning and so forth. Here's the reality. We have to communicate in such a way that we find a win-win scenario, right? And for some, they get really focus on strong arming it because people don't change as fast as they should change. And I get it. I know there's a lot of politics in the middle of that, but here's the reality. You can't shut a whole country down of their voice or their way of making a living and have it not equal pain going forward, right? Even in the United States, we've got to do a better job of communicating across the aisle. But Here's the thing, on both sides of the aisle, we get pigeonholed into what's extreme for our side. And you know what? There are some things to argue over, but why aren't we having the conversation? Why do we do backdoor meetings and so forth instead of really addressing the issues at hand? Does that mean that everybody needs to give a little bit of compromise? You, uh, you bet. That is part of having open dialogue, communication, and so forth. So here's my thought, and it's kind of mixed with some politics. It's mixed with some Tucker Carlson. It's mixed with um, world leaders, and it's mixed with my idea to just send this message to all leaders, managers, supervisors. If you're one, I just want to remind you, it is your job to encourage feedback. It is your job to encourage in a management meeting or a team meeting to 
Maybe not start off by sharing your idea, but asking what their idea, the, the, the participants' ideas are before you share yours. Because when you share your ideas first as a manager, what does that do? Everybody just goes, yep, that makes sense. You're the manager. We'll follow you. You have responsibility. We'll follow you. And guess what happens? The best idea doesn't always rise to the top. So my suggestion to you is next time you're in your meeting, next time you're in your one-on-ones, which I hope you're doing regularly, um, once you're in a conversation, hey, invite the people in that meeting to voice their thoughts openly without reprise, right? Without um, a sense that they might get in trouble because they were too bold or their idea was stupid and so forth. Some of the greatest ideas that have made company millions is because the leaders of those organizations valued input. Not that every idea was taken and used, but you know what? In some cases, those ideas were taken and used and helped the companies make millions. Just think of Southwest Airlines. Someone came up with the idea, right? If you want to get in the A group, because it's all based on when you log in uh, for your flight, you get in either the A group, which you get first pick of the seats, or you get in the B group or the C group. Well, someone said, well, hey, what if people are willing to pay $25? I don't know if that's the cost today or not, but $25 to automatically get into the A group. So you get first choice of seats. Well, guess what? That was accepted by leadership. They adopted that and it's made Southwest Airlines a lot of money. What's another one that we could use? What about Horst Schulze, right? He's the co-founder of the Ritz-Carlton Hotels. Well, what did he do? When, when he created the culture and helped create the culture at the Ritz-Carlton Hotels around the world, they listened to the ideas of people. Well, what was one idea? Well, they realized that, hey, they were washing a lot of towels because people were using multiple towels for single showers and so forth. And so a maid somehow had an idea. It got up to a manager who probably got up to the executive team and so forth where they decided, hey, I wonder if we could, the suggestion from the maid was, why don't we put a hook in the bathroom and maybe people would hang up their towel and they would use the towel twice before it's needed to be washed. Well, guess what? They ended up putting a hook in every bathroom around the world in all the hotels and the washing of towels reduced by 30%. Imagine the millions of dollars because of that single idea that they were willing to listen to that it saved the company millions of dollars. And I can give you hundreds of examples of those kinds of scenarios of because leaders were willing to listen to their people and they sought the feedback, they reached out and said, we want to hear your ideas. I remember I was in an exec, I was doing an executive coaching call for a manager, but also for the director who was the boss of the manager. I was doing conference calls for both. As I was listening to the lady who was the manager, I remember she, man, when I would get on the phone call with her in terms of um, coaching and so forth, I could just hear her talk and she had so many great ideas for the organization. But you know what? It seemed like she was always shut down every time she shared an idea. So I said, when's the last time you had something to say in a management meeting? She goes, very rarely. I don't speak up anymore. And you know what? I went to the director and I said, hey, listen, you've got a manager here that has amazing ideas that maybe you should be listening to. Maybe there's some ideas that can benefit the overall production of the team. And over time, we were able to change that. What all happened? The only thing that happened was respect and then the ability to listen to each other and accept those things that uh, it was agreed upon as a group that it would help the team operate better or what have, have you. I remember sometime around after 9-11, I was training 800, actually total two sets, 800 participants each day, but a total of 1,600 employees at Hill Air Force Base. And I was doing this training and I remember I was talking about, hey, 
be open communicators, share information as much as possible, so forth, back and forth. And I remember a full colonel came to me, it was a female, came to me and said, hey, I got to tell you, this is during the break, said, hey, I got to tell you something. After 9-11, I was called to work down at CENTCOM and I worked directly with a four-star general. And she says, you know, that concept that you were talking about, this is going on, what are we, 24 years ago. Um, as we were talking about uh, communication and so forth, she says, when I was down at CENTCOM, this four-star general, whenever you had a new idea or a way of doing something differently, his response was, she told me, his response was, always, let's see how we can make that work. And then would send her away to go see if she could go make that work, if it made logical sense, once she invested some time and energy in discovering whether that would be a good option or not. You know what? Some of the times it worked, sometimes it didn't. I said, what if he automatically disagreed with the idea? She said, rarely would he just shoot it down. He would say, let's see how we can make that work. And then she would go do her research, she told me. And then they'd find out, oh, it doesn't really make sense for this reason or that reason. He'd go back to the general. And the general said, I know, but I wanted you to experience that. I wanted you to learn. It's fine. We don't need to go with that. And I just remind you, if you're a leader and a manager, listen. Listen to your people. Okay? Encourage them to communicate. Hear what they have to say, and the organization will be the benefactor in the long run. In fact, you will be the benefactor. Some people don't share information, and they limit the information because they're afraid, if I share all my information with maybe my colleague or whatever, why will they need me anymore? I just gave them all my information. And then you, you kind of self-preservation to protect my own job so we control. Here, I'm a big believer that you share information you give control instead of take control. I'm telling you, in the long run, leaders that share information, that train their people, that give their team members as much authority and power as possible are the leaders who win in the future. Why? Because they're team players. Why? Because they work well with other people. Why? Because they're respected. Instead of hoarding the information, limiting the information for, because you have a rival or you're afraid someone might take advantage of that information and then leap over you in terms of progression in your company, I would hope that you would think more from a, um, an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. Okay, listen, I know that I've said a lot about this, but it, to me it's systemic. We just, I mean, you got um, General McChrystal who said, share as much information until you think it's illegal. Everything, unless it's highly confidential or Ill illegal to share, you should be sharing as much information with your team. Even if you think, well, they're, it doesn't really apply to them. If it's something that could impact them or just making them aware could benefit them, here's the reality. Share it with them. The research shows that people want to be in on things. That's the research. So why wouldn't you share something with maybe a different department or something um, and share. We sure have a, a pattern of sharing negative things that go around the office building pretty quick. Why don't we share the good things or the ideas or the thing, right? Instead of people operating from vagueness and imagination, hey, let's do a better job when it comes to sharing information and not push back people that don't agree with our ideas. Hey. Let's put all the ideas out on the table and then let's pick with the ones that we think will be more applicable and beneficial to us as a company, as an individual, as a family, as a parent, as a church leader, and yes, as a country, all right? Don't get so pigeonholed in one way that we can't hear maybe a perspective that maybe part of that perspective can be applied, but we gotta be able to listen to it, all right? No, I kind of went long on that. Hopefully that was beneficial to you. And now may the best of your past be the worst of your future. Go out there and unleash your greatness within.